following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. You know, speaking of worshiping together, believers have been getting together on the first day of the week, Sunday, for over 2,000 years, for 2,000 years. Believers all over the globe, all over the globe throughout history have been gathering on Sundays to get together with God and to worship. Now, when we get together and we open up the word and we start reading about God and we start looking at scripture, hopefully we're not doing it to just learn about God. I do hope we get to learn about God, but I hope we're not just doing it to know about God. I hope we're doing it to know God. Amen? I mean, we gather not just out of ritual or anything. We, we get together to know God. And the mission of this church is to know God and to make him known. And I think when people really get to know God, you want to make him known. Making him known is an outflow out of your life. But if you just know about God, it's different. There are some people that are theologians that know about God but don't know God. The Bible says without the spirit of God, we cannot even discern the things of God. So you can know about God, but not know God. And my prayer today is that we know God. In fact, if you have your Bible, you can open up to Romans chapter 5. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, a couple weeks ago. We're going through the book of Romans, and it's the book that changed the world. The globe has been forever changed as a result of the Bible, but specifically some stuff in this book of Romans is explosive. And I want to start out with a story uh, first. Uh, Back on May 11th in 2000, Uh, A lady found an email in her inbox, and it looked pretty innocent. It simply said, I love you. And she thought that was a pretty cute thing for somebody to send her an I love you email. So she was kind of curious as to what it might be, and she clicked on this email out of curiosity. And when she did, the love bug virus was born. With lightning speed, it raced around the planet, infecting millions of computers crashing governments and businesses' computers around the globe. And it was a deadly virus. One virus, but so much contamination. But it's not the first time that a single virus caused widespread catastrophe. In fact, early on, much earlier, there was a more deadly virus that hit planet Earth, and it affected the whole human race. Despite God's warning for Adam and Eve to not click on it, they clicked on it anyway. And it started another deadly virus. It's a sin virus that went global. It went viral and affected everyone ever since. And today we're going to be talking about the first Adam and what actually happened with the first Adam. But we're also talking about the second Adam because the Bible talks about Jesus as the second Adam. And it's pretty cool when you look at the first Adam and the second Adam, you put them together, you actually weigh out the differences. You look at some realities, some spiritual truths, Today we're calling this splitting atoms, okay? We're going to be splitting some atoms today. Now, it's not nuclear physics. We're not in here like with a, you know, going to start some chain reaction or something like that. Um, But this kind of splitting atoms is more important because when you can split these kind of atoms, you understand past, present, and future in a way that splitting a natural atom never will. Uh, And it is even more powerful than splitting a natural atom because when you can split these kind of atoms... There's futures at stake for everyone around the globe. Very explosive stuff. So follow along if you, if you will. There's a place to take notes in your bulletin if you're a note taker. Um, and we're going to look at this in sections. It starts in verse 12. That's where we left off last week. And it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as Adam, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. Think about this reality. It says sin entered, entered the world. You think of the planet. Get a visual on that. You got this planet down here. Everything is pure. And through one guy, one gal, something entered in. That totally changed the future. Kind of like that love bug virus. It's like, do you click it or not click it? Do you think it'll affect the world or not? Will it affect you or not? 
And if it does affect you, will it affect others around you? And some are like, mm, I want to try it anyway. And just think of that sometimes how one action of a guy, a gal, of anyone can have radical consequences, not just to ourselves, but to others around us. This says it entered the world. It had to have an entry point. It had to start somewhere. And it says that it started with Adam. Now, let's be honest. If it didn't start with Adam, it would have started with me. It would have started with you. Can we be honest about that? I mean, it would have started. Sin would have started somewhere. And we look at the Bible, not only Adam, we look at his sons, Cain and Abel. It also would have started with them when we read the story, but it would start. But it's amazing how actions can have enormous consequences, both good and bad. I mean, one action can have catastrophic consequences one way. Other actions can have explosive consequences the other way. You think about that. You think historically of some of the people in civilization who did some uh, serious collateral damage and their actions had effects on many, but you look at others, you look at like a Mother Teresa and how she changed the lives of thousands of people. Wow, can that actually happen out of one person? Yes. You look at the Billy Grahams who, who, who changed the future of you know, millions of people. You look at so many, just you and I meeting people on the street, looking them in the eye and being real and sharing the love of God, that actions can change consequences. Things enter into the world through you and through I. It's pretty amazing. I, I'd like to ask you when you think about that potential, think about what is going to enter the world through you. Because things are going to enter the world through you and through me. Think about that. In fact, if you only go home with one take home today, one question, ask yourself, what is going to enter the world through me? Because I guarantee you there's so much potential in that. And if you're praying and you're checking with God and you're aiming in the right direction, there's going to be a lot that can enter this world through you in a profound and a good way. I believe that's the heart of God. In Adam's case, he had this action. It was sin and we know it caused death. Now, I want to say something about death because it comes up here. We think of death as being non-existent or that's what a lot of folks tend to think of death. In the Bible, death never ever meant non-existence. Nowhere in the Bible does death mean non-existent. Death means separation. It always meant separation. When someone dies, the body leaves, the spirit leaves the body, and there's separation. It doesn't mean non-existence. And what happened in this case, remember the devil said, you won't surely die? And Eve was concerned, well, will we surely die or not surely die? And she was thinking about what's going to happen here with this death thing. It wasn't separating the body from the spirit the moment this happened. It was separating us from God. That's what we know what happened in the, in the garden when this entered the world. They use this term um, in the insurance industry all the time called consequential damage. Have you guys heard this term? Consequential damage. In other words, there can be something that happened, an accident, but there can be a whole bunch of consequential damage. That's the chain event of all the other stuff. There's the initial action and then all the other reactions. And what happened here in the garden is, is, is Adam and Eve, they sinned and it caused separation with God. But here's the deal. That's not all it caused. There was a bunch of collateral damage. There was a bunch of consequential damage. And we read in Genesis chapter 3 that they were not only separated from God, they were banished from the garden, right? They were banished from the garden. And also, if you read in the detail of what happened, it says the ground was cursed and there was hardship and pain that was going to change the future of humanity for the rest of time until the second Adam came. I want to say this because some people, they look at the bad news without remembering the good news. It says here that Adam was a pattern of the things to come, meaning when you see these patterns in the Bible and there's a bunch of really cool patterns that happen in the Old Testament, you really got to take note of them because it means something happened as a pattern. Be aware there's going to be something explosive in the New Testament that was a pattern of the old one. Got to understand these patterns. In this case, it was a pattern of Jesus Messiah. You see, the first Adam, he paved the way for separation, but the second Adam, he paved the way for restoration. And what we're going to look at, and a lot of folks don't look at this all the way. They don't look at deep enough. They don't look at the patterns deep enough. But if you really want to know God, you got to understand that this second Adam, guys, the second Adam when he came, he came to 
to resolve the sin issue, but he also came to resolve a bunch of the collateral damage. That's what folks miss out on. The second Adam didn't only come, yes, the main event was to resolve the sin separation issue, but there's a whole bunch of other consequential damage that he came to restore, and a lot of folks ignore that. That's why we gotta split some atoms this morning to understand the reality of this. And so the first thing, if you're a note taker this morning, uh, to understand the differences as we split our atoms this morning is that the first atom gave us paradise lost. That's what he gave us. But the second atom, paradise found. See, the second atom just didn't take away sins. He certainly did that. That's the main event. That was his main mission. But there was even more to it. He came to restore. He came to redeem that which was lost. And that's going to get pretty explosive. We're going to look at more of that in a second here. It moves on in verse 15. And it says, But the gift, meaning the gift of the second Adam, is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Exclamation point. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one man's one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as though disobedience of the one man, the many, excuse me, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will, the many will be made righteous. He's talking here, he uses this term overflow. I think it's an important word to look at. He's basically saying Adam's life, it had an overflow. Whether you like it or not, there was an overflow from Adam's life. In other words, his overflow in, uh, affected the entire generations to come behind him in the entire family line. And so just like your and my DNA, we all have DNA, we have a unique DNA, but DNA can actually trace families. Do you know that? They can trace family genetically DNA, and they could go way back to tell where people are from. And just like you and I inherited things from our parents, whether we're tall or short or heavy or thin, there are genetic things that we inherited. We also inherited a spiritual DNA. And it goes all the way back, this is saying, all the way back in our family line to Adam. So you know what that means? It means that we were all born sons of Adam. Ladies, you were born daughters of Eve. I don't know if you've thought about that, but we were all born sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. In fact, in the Chronicles of Narnia, if you're familiar with the story, it's a pretty amazing story. The, the young kids uh, break through to the other side of Narnia. They're in a different world. And when they enter this world, sometimes it's just one boy entering or one girl at a time. Sometimes it's all of them. But when they're discovered in Narnia, the people that discover them in Narnia are very shocked and surprised. And when they look at them, they say, wait a minute, are you a daughter of Eve? You are? You're a daughter of Eve? Whoa. And they're, they're, they're blown away because they know there's capacity here. They know there's potential. And the other side is pretty blown away. They also find the boys and they say, are you a son of Adam? Are you a son of Adam? And they want to know because if you're a son of Adam and a daughter of Eve, there's a whole different potential on the other side. The Chronicles of Nardia presents that really, really well. The reality is this, guys. You and I were born sons of Adam. We were born daughters of Eve, because the DNA of what Adam did is in us, and this is what the passage is saying. But here's the good news. Even though the first Adam had an overflow effect, the good news is there is, in fact, a second Adam, and the second Adam has a radical overflow effect. And here's the thing. He undid the damage of the first Adam. Again, we usually look at Adam sinned, Jesus takes away sins. Bingo. 
That's the main event. That will always be the main event. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. But what else did Jesus do? What else did Jesus do? It's important to look at his mission. It's important to look at his ministry. It's important to look at the people who followed him in the first century church, what they did regarding the mission of Jesus. Because Jesus came to redeem that which was lost. He came to restore. Uh, but when we look at this, it says, uh, the passage says that his gift brings life to all men. He gives life he gives overflow. It says in verse 17, God's abundant provision of grace. It's abundant. There's so much grace in the redemption of what the second Adam did. It's bigger than just, if forgiveness is the main event, but it's even more. And I would suggest to you that the first Adam brought us this bad news of, of captivity and bondage and death, but check this out. The second Adam undid all this. If you, uh, in fact, we have for the projector, if you have Luke uh, chapter 4. Listen what Jesus says about his own ministry. If Jesus came to redeem, if Jesus came to restore, was it sin only or was it sin and more that he came to restore? I would suggest to you in the garden, there was a lot more than just sin that was robbed and destroyed. There was sin and the collateral damage. There was sin and the consequential damage and the fallout. Remember the ground was cursed? Remember they were banished from the garden? There's a whole sequence of chain events. Jesus says this about his own ministry. Jesus is standing in, in Galilee. He, he's standing in a town called Capernaum in a, in a synagogue that Christy and I had the opportunity to go stand in that still stands today where he stood up there, opened up the scroll of Isaiah and read to the people about himself as the Messiah and says the spirit of of the Lord is on me because he has anointed, has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed. Forgiveness of sins is a main event, but there's other stuff going on in the kingdom of God. When God came to town, when love came to town, when you look at the, the reality of what Jesus said and what he did, the kingdom of God is certainly about forgiveness. That's the target. That's the main event. But also, it's for the other collateral damage. Do you guys get that? There's a bunch of other collateral damage. There's other consequential damage that Jesus came to restore in the big picture. That's important because there's folks walking around, guys, all over the city, in your neighborhood, in your family, and on your block that need to understand that Jesus restores all of the stuff that was lost. You see, they're looking around and people understand the fallout of this world. They might not know it's because of the first Adam, but they don't know about the second Adam. They don't. They don't understand the power of redemption. They don't understand the power of restoration. They don't really get it. But the reality is there's folks that need to hear good news who are poor in spirit. There are some that are in bondage that need freedom and they don't even know where to find it. They're looking everywhere for freedom and they're just not finding it because they haven't met the second Adam church and they need recovery of sight for the blind because they're just not seeing things in three dimension in the natural and in the spiritual but the second Adam restores that sight and, and release from the oppressed. There's levels of oppression in people's lives that only the living God, the second Adam, can give an outflow from the inside out that only comes from the throne of grace through the second Adam. People don't get that. And there's even things in the natural. You look at Jesus in his ministry. Sometimes he'd look at people and say, your sins are forgiven, sin no more. Other people, he would walk up to them and say, what is it you want? I want to see. And Jesus would put his hands on them and heal them in the natural. So the spiritual and the things of the soul and the things of the body were all being restored through the ministry of Jesus Christ. I only want to say that because some people don't understand the dimensions and the nature of the second Adam. They look at the main event forgiveness, some, and they walk away from the rest. I want to suggest to you, church, that the second Adam came to redeem that which was lost. He is the second Adam of restoration. And it's pretty amazing to me. It says in, um, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, we have these scriptures. You might want to jot them down. Uh, 15.22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Here's your first Adam. There's your second Adam. One brings death. 
One brings life. The other one in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. A life-giving spirit. In other words, he just didn't come. He came and he's a life. He actually gives life. He gives life. He gives abundant life. I came that you might have life and life to the fullest, life abundantly. Some are walking around going, well, I want my sins taken away. I know nothing about abundant life. I know nothing about life to the fullest. And Jesus is like, do you understand what I came to do as the second Adam? I came that you might have life to the fullest, life abundantly, not just eternity. Yes, eternity, but fullness here and now to be light, to be salt, that living water can flow out of you. These are Jesus' words. And some are like, I don't really know what that is. Church, get to know the second Adam. Understand the ministry of the second Adam. Understand the full gospel of the second Adam because it is explosive and there's so much more to understand. The more I look at Jesus, I've been a student of the word for you know 20 years, but the more I look at the ministry of Jesus, the resurrected one, the second Adam, the more I'm floored and blown away. I keep coming back and discovering these new aspects about him and it's not to know about him, it's to know him. And so this is, this is really important stuff. The first Adam brought death, second Adam brought life. The first Adam was a life taker. Second Adam was a life giver. And he came to redeem. Now, here's the deal. If we're going to redeem the human race, if God's going to redeem the human race, he had to do it by sending a second Adam. He saw what the first Adam did, and the father's like, I got to send a second Adam. I got to send a second Adam to redeem what the first Adam Adam did. And so God sent his son to become flesh, which we're about to celebrate Christmas time. And this is the part about taking on the flesh nature. He had to do that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been a second Adam. Jesus himself says some radical stuff. He referred to himself often as the son of man. Isn't that interesting? You're like, why are you calling yourself the son of man? He goes, because I am. All the way through that DNA on Adam's side, I am a son of man. I'm the second Adam. And it's pretty interesting. He would tell you, I come to you as a human. On my mother's side, that is. But on my father's side, it's different. You see, on my mother's side, they call me Jesus. (laughs) But on my father's side, I'm Emmanuel. On my mother's side, I have a birthday. But on my father's time, I'm the rock of ages. You see this paradox going on here? To be the second Adam, he had to do this. In fact, years ago, Christy and I were uh, up in Yosemite with a bunch of friends, and we were just newly engaged, and we were uh, up there. It was a really cool thing. And at the campground, they had a little chapel service on a Sunday. And we were a bunch of believers. We're like, hey, let's go check this thing out. I don't know what they do out in the campground, but it's kind of cool. They put on a little Sunday service. It was an older couple. They were like 80, 85 years old. They had been serving God their whole life. They were out in the middle of the forest in this campground putting on a little chapel service. And the wife played a little bit of piano, the husband played a little guitar, and he did a little preaching. They tag teamed. It was beautiful just seeing these guys. Like, they had the joy of the Lord all over the place. You couldn't deny it. Um, and these guys were, a lot of things entered the world through them, you can tell, through their course of life. But they got up and did this song. I think it's an old country song, but they got up and this so- did this song, and the song was called On My Father's Side. You can Google, Google the song, pull it up on iTunes, but uh, on my father's side. And they go asking Jesus, who are you, son? And he says, well, on my mother's side, they call me Jesus. But on my father's side, I'm Emmanuel. And on my mother's side, you know, I, you know he, he just goes on with all these explanations. The reality is this, the second Adam is in fact the son of man, but he's the son of God. And that's the beauty. We're going to be dealing with that more at Christmas time, but on my father's side. The passage goes on to say that through what he did, through his price, he makes people two things that come up in Romans again and again and again, and that's why it's the book that changed the world. It says that he makes people justified and righteous. This is important, guys, because there have been people going through history since the beginning of time trying to deal with stuff on the inside, saying, okay, we all sin, we all fall short, but what do I do with this stuff? 
And there's been people in my tradition, I was raised Catholic, and maybe some of you were as well. And I, I know friends that have a great relationship with God as a Catholic, so I'm not here to discount or knock that. I'll tell you my experience and some of my other friends that I've talked to with the background of being Catholic or any other religion, many religions, is trying to deal with what does it really take to be right with God? And you try and you know you're still not right with them because you still feel either guilt or shame or condemnation and you, you struggle with this internal mechanism even though you're trying and you're always going, what's it gonna take, what's it gonna take, what's it gonna take? That was my story. That was the story of Martin Luther as well. And when he read this passage about what it takes to be justified, what it takes to be righteous, he's like, what? You mean to tell me that through what Jesus did alone, my faith in what he did alone, nothing else added, I am justified just as if I'd never sinned. Justified? I'm justified before God just by what Jesus did, not me doing a thing. And I'm actually declared righteous, literally like I can stand in the presence of God with no issues, even though I've done stuff. Seriously? Book of Romans was telling him yes. And he's like, whoa, the world needs to know about this. Because the world, for many years, a thousand years at that point, had forgotten about that. And we're trying to add all these things you do to pay penance and to pay back and to get right with God and do more works. And still today, there's people knocking on doors, earning their way, they think, to get there. You don't have to do any of that. It's a declared thing. It's a freely given thing. And it's through faith. And that's, he says, what the second Adam did. He makes us justified and he made us righteous. And that, guys, is why the Son of God became the Son of Man. And if you're a note taker, write this one down because this is a powerful insight. I love this phrase. I love this statement. It helps to revolutionize our, our understanding of the living God when it comes to splitting atoms. Here we go. The son of God became the son of man so that sons of man might become sons of God. The son of God became the son of man so that sons and daughters of, of man, sons and daughters of Adam, might become sons and daughters of God. Why is this important? Because you and I have all kinds of friends, families, neighbors, everybody who's walking around as a son of Adam. They're walking around as a daughter of Eve to this day. And that's not their future. That's their past. There's a whole new future. They can be a son of God, a daughter of God. It says in John chapter one, to as many that received him, talking about Jesus, the second Adam, to as many that received him, to them he gave the right, listen, he gave the right to become sons of God. You're like, what? Is that a right? Yes, it's a right. And God gives it to you freely. How many sons of Adam and daughters of Eve want to become sons and daughters of God? And it's laid out there. And some are like, well, I didn't know it actually worked like that. Wow. And others are like, what does that mean? And others have just never heard it. The reality is this. The devil is not afraid that you're a son or daughter of Adam. You know that? The devil's not afraid if you're a daughter of Eve or a son of Adam. He's very familiar with that. The devil starts getting very afraid when you're a son of God or a daughter of God. Because along with what's been given to you has been given the spirit of God inside of you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He knows the promises God has for you. He knows if you walk in faith to the promises of God, you are unstoppable, that you are more than conquerors in Christ. He knows all that. But none of that applies if you're a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve. It only applies if you're a son of God or a daughter of God. To as many that would receive him, he gave the right to become sons of God. That's why the son of God became the son of man, so that sons of man might become sons of God. It's a beautiful snapshot. And the other thing about this, guys, when he does this for you, when he justifies you, when he takes away sins, when he gives you a new beginning, he says, behold, I make all things new. Again, that's the main event. But also, he gives you a new identity. You might want to write that word down this morning. Just write identity down. Would you say identity with me? Identity. Say it, say it again. Identity. Guys, I, I think one of the biggest dilemmas in the church today globally is people not knowing their identity. Quite simply, you have a new one whether you feel like it or not. And it's a God-given one. And when you walk in your God-given identity, everything changes. 
Your whole future changes. Not because you feel things, because it's a spiritual fact of life and a reality that you walk out. The Bible is full of snapshots of your identity and mine. Reminding of us what our old one was, like a son, and da- son of Adam and a daughter of Eve. But the reality is there's a new identity. And if we understand that identity and in faith walk in it, it changes the entire future. But some go, I don't know much about my identity, but I simply don't feel like that right now. And they just miss out on so much. You know, identity is key. I would encourage you as an action point, get with God this week and say, Father, would you, would you explain a little more about my identity? If I am not a son of Adam and a daughter of Eve anymore, if I'm a son of God, daughter of God, would you explain my identity? Because guys, it gets explosive. You can go into this Christmas season totally different and launch your new year on a whole different avenue, unlike any other year of your life, when you walk in the fullness of identification. It's a really big deal. Uh, verse 2 told us a couple weeks ago that we have gained access by faith. In other words, part of your identity is you're a son or daughter of God. You can enter the Father's presence. It's not like, whoa, I don't know, he's God. I don't, I'm not sure if he's hearing my prayer or, you know, if I can get close. I don't know. I, I'm not really sure if I can do that. No, your new identity says you can because you're a son or a daughter and your father says, come, I love you. And that's why we have access by faith and we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Radical stuff. There's all sorts of things that apply to your life in your identity because you're a son of God, a daughter of God, not just a son of Adam and a daughter of Eve. See, the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve were separated and they were out of the garden and the ground was cursed and there was a lot of fallout. But when you become a son of God, a daughter of God, that's when the restoration process happens. It begins first with your spirit being made new, being born again of water and spirit. That means the life that you and I had in Adam, that died. You're no longer a son of Adam, a daughter of Eve. That dies. You have a new life in the son of God, daughter of God. But there's also other areas of redemption to the human soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions because he makes all things new. And there's also realities in the natural and in the flesh. And when you look at the gospels, you see the believers walking all of it out. Why? Because the second Adam was about redemption, restoration, to redeem that was lost, to bind up the brokenhearted. There was many dimensions, recovery of sight for the blind, freedom from the oppressed, the captives. There's a full picture in the ministry of the second Adam. Um, The last thing, in fact, if the worship team could come up, I just want to close on this last note. It says in in the passage, verse 20, it continues, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, also grace might even reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's basically saying in the beginning, they didn't even have the written law. Moses, was, uh, Adam was just told, hey, don't touch that tree. Don't you know, break that rule. And they broke that rule. But later on, Moses writes the law and it gets much more detailed. And the law basically set up parameters and boundaries And basically what he's saying is it brought definition to sin. Before that, they didn't have a lot of definition. Then there was a lot of definition. And the point being this, guys, no matter how much sin increased through Adam, through people, through you and through me, check this out, no matter how much it increased, grace increased even more. That's the radical part of the second Adam. In other words, there's no one on the planet who's not redeemable. There's no one on the planet who's done a thing that the grace of the second Adam doesn't surpass the sin of the fallout of the first Adam. And that's good news for me. (laughs) That should be good news for you. And that should be good news for everyone we know. Third point this morning is that where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Doesn't matter what. Doesn't matter in our lives. Doesn't matter if and when we mess up when we leave here today or through the week or through the month or friends, family, neighbors, everyone you know, we all fall short. The cool thing, guys, is where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. You need to know that. You need to hold on to that. Some folks forget about that. And they think, well, I messed up. And they start drifting and walking away, thinking that their own situation is not redeemable. Don't believe that. The devil would love for you to believe that. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. And you remember that. If you sin, when you sin in the future, not if, when, 
When we sin in the future, remember where sin abounds, grace abounds more. You show me the consequence of any man's sin, and I'll show you the consequence of one man's grace. And that's beautiful. That means there's hope for everyone. And so I would just want to encourage you today. I want to pray for some of you. Maybe, maybe some of you just haven't um, you've been thinking about that, but maybe you might say, you know, I think I'm still kind of a son of Adam, still kind of a daughter of Eve. And uh, it's time. It's time to be a son of God. It's time to be a daughter of God. That's a beautiful time to start. Today is the day. Don't wait. We're going to pray. Uh, prepare your heart for that. Um, Also, for others, I would encourage you to to not only know the second Adam more and walk in the fullness of the ministry of the second Adam, but I would encourage you to go out there and find some sons of Adam. Go out there and find some daughters of Eve and introduce them to the second Adam who restores that which was lost, who binds up the brokenhearted. There's freedom for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind. Begin to walk in the full gospel ministry of the second Adam, who will never leave you or forsake you. And there's a lot of future in that. There's a lot of hope in that. That's what the world needs to see. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit valleymetrochurch.com.